I am the interstellar mediator, Sol 13, Terra 3, forest monk, university professor, mother and author, respect and love, greetings. Let's continue to lift the veil to grasp the nature of the current transition to a new reality. The ambassadors and art piece dating from 1533 by the German painter Hans Holbein the Younger and kept at the National Gallery in London presents in the foreground a curious technical feature. The first time we look at the painting we wonder why a talented painter left a distorted element which seems unfinished in the foreground of a work which is finally structured and perfectly executed in the Renaissance style. This distorted element actually is a technical feat. It is an anamorphosis. This eye-catching element represents a human skull if we look at the painting from the front, it is distorted, but when we swap perspectives and look at it from another angle, the skull returns to its natural shape. In the case of this work, it is necessary to physically move towards the right border of the painting and look at it in diagonal grazing. The use of anamorphosis with a graphic, textual, social or cultural forces the spectator to change position to seek the best possible angle of view and understand what he or she sees or hears. You have to have a daring curiosity to change your intellectual or spiritual perspectives. Similarly, in this zincography entitled Where is our grandmother? Où est sa grand-mère? exhibited in the City Museum in Epinal in France in the Pellerin collection dating from 1901 you have to change your perspective to be able to see the grandmother. When watching these videos, you change your perspective to look at your reality from a different angle. You begin to perceive the aspects of this reality that didn't make sense and you previously missed. Much like in the case of the skull in Holbein's work. For example, when we shift our focus from a belief system in which the Earth is presented as the only inhabited planet to another perspective, one where life is so prolific that it is the norm in a galaxy that has billions of suns and billions upon billions of planets, we change the angle of perception and as in Holbein's painting we begin to perceive things in a different, more logical and clearer way. For the moment, few people are aware that it is possible and necessary to adopt other angles of view, not even 1% of the Earth's population. That percentage represents 77 million people and we are far from reaching that number yet. To change perspective is also undoubtedly to change the system of values and beliefs. Even if you, you have personally already developed the great moral and ethical qualities of the human race, such as integrity, equity, respect and love for others, 
service to others. From the point of view of the planet and humanity at large, and as the interstellar races note, more than 99% of humans are still divided, violent, sick, attached to a model of society where money and power are the master words and the measures of success and happiness. The videos in their proposals for other perspectives help as much as they can to push the limits of the anamorphic reality which is an optical illusion and to put things in their right places. Today, let's have a look at the artificial aspect of this new reality in order to have a balanced diptych, natural, artificial. The questions that you would be entitled to ask yourself now are why is there so much excitement around the issue of extraterrestrials and why have there been so many contacts since the past 50 years? Why are stellars who are highly respectful of indigenous cultures violating the recommendations and ethics of the Prime Directive which specifies in particular? Let's read together part of the Prime Directive. Articles of the United Federation of Planets, Chapter 6, Article 2, Paragraph 7. The Prime Directive is immediately applicable to all cultures in any planet that has not yet achieved an interstellar status and are capable of leaving their planet by their own means. As the right of each sentient species to live in accordance with its normal cultural evolution is considered sacred. No United Federation of Planets personnel of any race or culture may interfere with the autonomous, normal and healthy development of alien life and culture. Such interference includes introducing superior knowledge, power or technology to a world whose society is incapable of handling such advantages wisely. This directive takes precedence over any and all other considerations and carries with it the highest moral obligation. The United Federation of Planets personnel is not permitted to make contact with non-interstellar lesser races or races in development through any technological means in use or in service at this time or to be invented in the future unless such a race is threatened by an outside source. 1. The right of species to live in accordance with their normal development is sacred. 2. No interstellar race has the right to introduce knowledge, powers or technologies superior to the said cultures. 3. Interstellar races are not allowed 
to make direct contact with non-interstellar races. 4. Accept in the event of an external threat. We can then ask ourselves the following questions. Why do interstellar races violate the recommendations of the Prime Directive? What is going on exactly? Because, as mentioned, it could only be for one reason, an external threat. So, what is this threat? And why is it urgent since contacts seem to be accelerating? I got the answers to these questions bit by bit, mainly from my extraterrestrial mentor Zen, 154 years old elder, as well as from 20 people of different interstellar races, and Viera, Andromeda, and over a period of four years, from April 2016 until April 2020. This information is transmitted to me in writing, live, black on white, and in audio. It's not channeling nor telepathy. This information comes from in-situ visual observations which all of my contacts have made with their own eyes, supplemented by elements from extraterrestrial databases. These testimonies do not come from just one person but from around 20 individuals, and all of them agree. Furthermore, nothing that I will present in this video is of terrestrial origin and does not come from the human internet or human knowledge, even if some elements are similar. I am not going to deal today with the artificial programs controlling people, their thoughts, their emotions, or their attitudes, to focus only on the moon, because it is the most urgent, and because it is the moon, which is the masterpiece of the human matrix. When you understand the following, you will understand everything else. Look at this content seriously, please. Listen to it several times to fully understand. Put things back in their places and think further. The future of our children. Thank you. The Sun, the planets, and the Moon are the main celestial bodies that influence all natural life on Earth. But the Moon, in particular, has had a major role in human evolution for 12,000 years. It is the central masterpiece of the whole Earth's matrix. So, I'm going to tell you things straightforwardly. The moon, your moon, is not a moon. It is not natural as a planet is. It is an artificial object that was built by interstellar races and brought into Earth's orbit. It is a spacecraft, which is called a Dyson Sphere, or an artificial biosphere. You wanted to see a spacecraft up close? Well, there's one you can watch every day. It's in front of your eyes, and it's the Moon. This type of large spherical spacecraft that evolves at superluminal speeds 
is used by interstellar racers for deep space exploration. Its dimensions are enormous compared to the small round vessels of about 20 meters in diameter, which you call UFO, scout ships or tic-tac ships, which are the stellar equivalents of your cars on Earth. It is very old and it was built in titanium metal on the shipyards of Pitola, one of the planets of Arcturus in the constellation Brutus, home of the Tiesley Antiplex, the Arcturians. Its metallic structure is made up of metal buildings connected from inside the biosphere. You enter it in a spaceship by the equatorial axis in the center of the sphere or by specific entrances. The biosphere, the moon, is hollow. It had several levels inside, engine room, command and piloting areas, upper levels for space observation, administrative areas, boardrooms, hospitals, places for restoration, places for relaxation, meditation rooms, bodybuilding, private apartment areas on several bridges or levels, urban, rural, and marine. Originally, this biosphere was one of the living places of the Andromedans, who use artificial biospheres as planets, as they do with Viera Andromeda, for example, because they prefer, as they say, keep their investment mobile so that they can move their biospheres when needed or in case of danger. This enormous vessel was piloted by the crews in charge and brought to the vicinity of Earth about 12,000 years ago and 500 years after Tiamat had disintegrated. It was used for lack of anything better because it was badly damaged and had been contaminated with ionizing nuclear particles during the wars on Mars. Since being placed in the Earth's orbit, it has been emptied out and it was used as an FOB, a forward operating base, by many interstellar races. Before the biosphere moon was brought in, the Earth had no moon. She never had one. It was the planet Tiamat, which was considered to be the moon, and it was called Morning Star or Second Sun. It was Tiamat that the ancient people saw in the skies, not the current moon. And it was Tiamat who inspired the great myths of Nibiru and Ercobulus. During the wars on Mars, the shock waves from extraterrestrial weapons reached Tiamat, but it didn't explode. What actually happened was that the shock waves of the plasma weapons were so powerful, the energies of the planet to shift. The displacement of the energies then caused all the water on the planet to move completely unbalancing it. And it was this imbalance that caused, as in a domino effect, the destruction of the planet which disintegrated piece after piece, like shreds lost in space. Tiamat was four times larger than Earth and was mainly made of water. There were only a few continents. The solid part, the continents, which left in tatters, now constitute the asteroid belt. All of these asteroids are pieces of Tiamat. The liquid part, the water and the goose, 
black, red and green, fell both on Venus and on the Earth, which floated the two planets. On Earth, the water of Tiamat, which fell, was called the Great Flood. Once Tiamat disappeared, the cosmic dynamics were seriously disturbed. Planets drifted and shifted position, and the Earth began to be subject to irreversible orbit and climatic changes. It was then decided to stabilize it by replacing Tiamat with an artificial biosphere. The Andromedans, therefore, piloted the Moon and placed it where it is currently located. The Moon was brought in 12,000 Earth linear years ago. Tiamat had already disappeared for over 500 years. Wars still raged between the two opponents. On the one hand, the Euphopians, the United Federation of Planets and the Allies, and on the other, invaders of other extraterrestrial lineages. Both sides had suffered very heavy damages. They were all exhausted, lacked the necessary military resources and could no longer fight. Some of the attacking invaders chose to flee to Earth and hide there. The United Federation of Planets, UFOP, was not yet the UFOP at the time. It was a proto-council at first, only composed of the Andromedans and the Diazali Antiplex, which still later became the High Council of Andromeda, composed of 12 main species. The Euphopians thought that the situation could not be left as it was, because things would get worse. They consulted each other and found a solution. It was not the best solution because they knew the serious consequences for the natives and the Lyrians who had already settled on Earth, but they had no others and they were exhausted. This solution allowed compensate for the loss of cosmic balance which was at risk with the disappearance of Tiamat, regain control of a situation that eluded everyone and that risked degenerating far beyond what they had imagined, in particular the invasion of the entire Sol 13 solar system which would have been under the total control of the invaders. Not to leave extraterrestrial technologies on the biosphere available to scrap merchants, especially zero-point technologies. To imprison the invaders on Earth, even if the Euphopians knew the negative consequences for the indigenous populations. And from a strategic point of view, the consequences, even if they were tragic, were less so than leaving the entire solar system, Sol 13, under the control of these invaders. This made it possible to be able to intervene again later, which would not have been the case if the Euphopians lost control of the entire Sol 13 solar system. The invaders would have prevented them and they could not even have approached Earth as they currently do. One wonders what would have happened then to the Earthlings. The Euphopians therefore decided to use this old moon biosphere which had suffered heavy damage and had served as a nuclear target to trap the invaders in an electromagnetic net placed around the Earth and block them. This biosphere is the Moon. Unfortunately, this trap also closed on the Lyrians, 
who were already living on Earth at the time. Lyrians had fled their Lyra Vega solar system after being violently attacked by these same invaders. They had emigrated throughout this quadrant of the galaxy, notably in the constellations of the Pleiades, the Triangle, and Sol 13, and they had settled on Earth long before the disintegration of Tiamat. Trade and commerce between Tiamat and the Earth was flourishing long before the invaders burst onto Earth. The Euphopians installed relay antennas to set up the electromagnetic bubble around the Earth. Now, you must realize one thing. This happened 12,000 years ago. The Euphopians already possessed at that time what the human race is discovering in 2020 or has not yet discovered. It was not the UFOP itself that placed the bubble because it is a federation and it brings together a thousand planets, that is to say, billions of people. The UFOP is not an individual entity like a person. The race which placed the bubble is one of the interstellar races of the human Lyrian type, which I will not name here for the sake of respect for all the interstellar races. They placed the electromagnetic field around the Earth. Of course, this was in consultation with all the other planets engaged in this fight. The decision was not unilateral and in the minds of the Euphopians, it was only a temporary solution anyway. There were many dead and wounded after devastating wars, and they hoped to be able to heal, rest, restore troops and crews, as well as military forces, and they believed that with the electromagnetic field around the Earth, the invaders could not get out and the situation was under control. Their idea was to prepare to come back in force and finish the job, destroy the invading lines on Earth, solve the problem for good, and finally remove the electromagnetic bubble. But surprise, as events are not written in stone, the situation turned against them. While they were gathering new troops, the situation was reversed. The invading lines, helped by other people who came in vessels from outside the bubble, helped them redevelop their technology and get out of it. The Euphopians landed several times on Earth to liberate the Lyrians and the Earthlings and to withdraw the electromagnetic bubble. But when they landed, fierce fighting ensued, traces of which can still be seen on Earth, and it was in vain. In Earth history, they were called the Fallen Angels, or the Elohim. So the Euphopians brought the Moon Biosphere over, the structure of which are thousands of metal buildings are installed electromagnetic relay antennas, which I will talk about later, controlled by a central computer and artificial intelligence. From Viera Andromeda, which is stationed behind the Moon, the Moon biosphere is a real metallic sphere which resembles an opaque metal ball of steel, and this sphere is made up of buildings of all kinds which emerge from its structure and which are an integral part of its construction. In fact, what miners 
mean when they say they mine the moon is what a scrap dealer does when scrap is collected and sold or bartered. The miners are scrap metal workers who destroy buildings or vessels and recover everything that can be metals often unknown on earth, gold, silver, other precious metals, advanced technology, cockpits, offices, seats, screens, programs, like scrap dealers dismantle the old carcasses of cars that buyers reinstall on other vehicles. Then these metals and the advanced technologies recovered from the moon biosphere are put back on the exchange markets or delivered on other planets and reused either for other constructions or for reverse engineering. This is done in a spirit of reuse of natural resources by interstellar races who never throw anything away and who do not necessarily have access to these resources on their own planet. They reuse everything because all resources are precious, up to a single screw. All the constructions that you see from Earth are real, but it is the tallest part of certain buildings that are part of the structure of the Moon biosphere. All buildings are made of metal and connected below, from inside the biosphere. And what you see from Earth are the tall parts of towers or the buildings that protrude. A bit like on Earth, you see the towers of very tall buildings showing above the fog. The more you obliterate the height of the buildings, the less visible parts remain. And that is the reason the buildings spotted on the moon are so scattered. Let's now see the electromagnetic field that surrounds the Earth and has maintained life. The races that live here, the fauna and flora, at the frequency of 7.83 Hz and in 3D for the past 12,000 years. It is common for interstellar races to place an energy field around a planet for both a. protect it from space threats or invaders, b. to monitor its development, much like a gardener puts a cover over a garden during the growth to protect it from predators and colonizers and maximize its development. When this electromagnetic field is installed, it is in the same frequency as that of the planet, that is to say 50 Hz. Then the planet is terraformed, the interstellar races in charge bring flora, fauna and human life forms as it was the case for planet Earth billions of years ago. And that's why, by the way, there are dolphins on Earth of the Syrian lineage. The dolphins were brought here from Sirius. These electromagnetic fields are not installed in direct contact with the planet, but on the outer limit of its magnetosphere. All living things generate a field around them which you call aura and which has the shape of a torus. Likewise, all planets have a natural magnetosphere which is their aura and they all have the shape of a torus. A torus is the most basic guiding form expressed by consciousness. The Earth is a living and conscious being as where well as you are. It therefore also generates its own aura, which is none other than its magnetosphere. The outer limits of the Earth's aura are the Van Allen belts. When the solar flares and the cosmic waves reach the Earth, they hit the Van Allen belts, and we can see the increase in frequencies in the Schumann's resonances. Let's move on 
to the technology bridling the Earth's frequencies that is used from the Moon biosphere and the way it works. The universal frequency standard is 50 Hz, 5D, 5th density. It is also the standard of matter. Everything in this universe is in 50 Hz. The Moon is in 50 Hz, 5D. Before being under artificial control, the Earth was in 5D because it is its natural frequencies. The natural consciousness of the Earth is 5D and 50 Hz. Everything that is outside the Earth is in 5D, except for the Earth, which is in 3D. The Euphopians and allies, therefore, built 12 nuclear reactors to power the 10 engines and the Moon Biosphere Artificial Intelligence. The Artificial Intelligence of the Moon Biosphere has been programmed to emit a high energy beam towards the Earth to clamp and lower the frequencies to 7.83 Hz 3D. As the transmissions are directed towards the Earth, it is always the same side of the Moon which faces the Earth simply because it is on the side of the Moon where the relay antennas are located. The technology is quite simple. There are different models of network antennas like cell phone towers on Earth that send cone-shaped transmissions. But at this distance, the system would not have been powerful enough. It therefore parasites the Earth's magnetosphere so that it does the work for it at its outer level, that of the Van Halen belts. In other words, using the principle of negative or destructive interference, the reactors literally impose a specific frequency on the magnetosphere of the Earth, basing all the Earth, the fauna, the flora, and the population in the same frequency, 7.83 Hz, the 3D base, that of the Earth's matrix and Schumann resonances. To lower or decrease a frequency, it is enough to transmit a negative frequency of minus 42.17 Hz, change it from 50 minus 42.17 equal 7.83 Hz, which is the current state of matter on Earth and is equivalent to 3D and the Schumann resonances. The magnetosphere is then struck by a series of waves which are designed to combine the natural energy produced by the magnetosphere with the artificial energy of the reactors to form a radiant wall or a very dense barrier surrounding the whole planet. This type of radiation is ionizing and electromagnetic and it's devastating for Earth's biology. You now understand that the Schumann's resonances are not the natural state of the Earth. It is the result of a clamping, of a bridging of the Earth's frequency to lower it and maintain it in 3D. Here is a description of the Moon biosphere by someone who saw it in person in 2016. This is Zen, my mentor.
My whole team went there. It's completely empty and ghostly. It looks like a psychiatric hospital from the 50s. One wonders what types of experiments were done there. The biosphere is completely ransacked to recover all that is useful, different metals and other things. Everything collapses and there are ruins everywhere. Only abandoned buildings and dismantled spaceships remain because when the Allied intervention forces capture an enemy craft, they store it in one of the many underground bases and dismantle it entirely, piece by piece. Many secret space program spaceships have also been confiscated and are left on the moon, awaiting dismantling. Regarding the occupation of the moon, he adds, The moon is totally empty, but since 2009, there has been a Diazali Antiplex Arcturian base, which is used for meetings and for monitoring the moon and the area. The large Arcturian vessels are active and stationed on the surface. The smaller vessels that enter and exit the structure are mainly Euphopian discoid spaceships. They enter either by the access and the hangars, which are on the level of the lunar equator, or by specific entrances. The Euphopians took control of it thanks to an extremely powerful military force, and since 2009 it is the Euphopians who manage it. No one can come in without the authorization of the Euphop High Council or its supervision. Reactors have been kept in operation by the invaders for thousands of years but they are old and it is an outdated technology. Everything is disintegrating and the reactors fail one after the other. There were initially 12. Eight have already broken down. They were repaired but no longer work now. Four are still working and out of the four, only two are operational but only operate at 80% of their capacity. The other two will break down very quickly because they are badly damaged. When the last two fail, the two that remain and operate at 80% of their capacity will not be able to produce the energy of 12 reactors to keep the electromagnetic bubble up. The bubble has already disappeared at 80%. It becomes thinner and the 3D control decreases more and more. So the frequencies increase and add to those of solar flares and cosmic waves. The last two reactors that are still operating at 80% will also fail, whether we like it or not, and this will happen at any time now. Hence, this is the urgency that we are facing. 1. Your natural biological frequencies were intentionally or artificially reduced. Now it is only at 20% instead of 100%. So you have to know how to manage this kind of energy. 2. Your perceptual ranges were reduced. Now your senses are increased by 80%. 3. Your visual spectrum, your sensory perceptions. 4. Your consciousness, women and marine cycles circadian rhythms, all were restrained 
at 7.83 Hz and they are now increasing at full speed with peaks at 154 Hz 5 and this from at least three sources solar flares, cosmic waves and failed lunar reactors loosening the grip on Earth The UFOP, the UFOPians, have therefore decided, since the takeover of the Moon biosphere, to let them break down to stop the clamping system and let the biotop and the Earth's population regain its natural frequencies in 50 Hz. So, finally, the UFOPians succeeded in putting an end to the great interstellar conflicts. As promised, they came back to finish what they had started and they are removing the electromagnetic bubble. You are, therefore, no longer prisoners and you can no longer claim, as before, the status of war victims, of manipulated or controlled people to revile the interstellar races by video interposed and enjoin them to finish the work. They have done it and still do. Now it's up to you to get to work and become an autonomous and independent race. The consequences are enormous. Before, you were 100% in the matrix and everything is coming back to a normal, standard 50 Hz, 5D. The good news is 1. The Moon biosphere is completely empty and under the surveillance of the Euphopians for more than 11 years. No one can go there without their authorization and the traffic in humans spacing through has been stopped. 2. The reactors will not be repaired or replaced. They are kept to the strict minimum by the Diazeli Antiplex and the Allies to allow a gradual exit of humanity from the 3D reality in which it was maintained to a 5D reality. 3. Eight reactors have already failed. Two will also fail quickly and the last two will not be able to produce the two together the energy that was previously produced by 12 reactors to keep the electromagnetic bubble operational, it's going to weaken them even more and they'll definitely stop as well. The bubble will fall. This therefore means that you are already 80% in a 5D perspective and mentality. It's a very big change. You have already seen the difference in recent years and even more today. More and more people are waking up. Use this new energy to fully prepare to evolve in 50 Hz instead of 7.83 Hz. It's easy for some, but it requires considerable efforts in terms of life changes and perspectives as well as to physiologically bear with this new type of energy because as you can see with the Schumann resonances the frequencies are rising once every two or three days to several times a day and this rate will increase with the reactors failing the control of the matrix has ended. It's over. 
you can rejoice. But that doesn't mean the end of the problems for humans. It's a new type of life that is beginning. Life in 50 Hertz. And we are not at the end of our troubles. Because this is also where the greatest threat to the human race lies. As we saw earlier, the threat that prompts interstellar races to come out of their anonymous presence is this. The greatest threat to humanity is the brutal awakening of humans who are not prepared and it is already underway. Many people wonder what is happening to them. Millions and millions of people who know nothing about all this. A family of farmers lost in the middle of nowhere. A school teacher in a kindergarten that knows nothing about any of this. Soldiers and the military who know nothing about the new reality will all wake up suddenly overnight when the last two engines will stop. All these people will start to see with the 50 Hertz zoom, their visual spectrum, their perceptions, their hearing, their feelings, their thoughts, their telepathy, everything will suddenly expand. They will feel high frequencies to which they are not used. They will become telepathic and wonder why they hear voices or radio or television channels in their ears or head and they will have the feeling of going crazy. They will see vivid colors and have strange dreams. Or they will see themselves in other timelines or other worlds. Perhaps they will see several themselves at the same time and think that they have hallucinations. They will see all the symptoms and signs of the matrix control since birth and they will think they have been deceived. They will accuse their neighbors, their governments, their federation. They will see ghosts, negative entities, reptilians in their natural bodies that roam the streets of big cities. And there will be glitches in the matrix and buildings will no longer be in their exact place on earth. Egos will take over. Madness, fear, hatred, violence and rage. And as only a threat can authorize the interstellar races to derogate from the prime directive, it is this threat of the brutal awakening of humanity that is left without preparation, which motivate all the interstellar races to come out of their anonymity and to show themselves little by little, contact humans directly and speed things up since we are still far from the 1% of awakening 77 million people. Now is the time to start explaining what is happening to all those around you. Prepare them, take care of them and or create support or discussion groups. Talk about it without forcing, without drama or mystery, with kindness and respect for their person. It doesn't matter if they deny it. Do not insist. You told them, so they know about it. Ascension is not taking an elevator and going up to another physical dimension or an extraterrestrial paradise planet because they too have their problems. 
their limits, their conflicts, and their hopes. Just like you, they must evolve and drop the limits of their ways of thinking and their own belief systems. Be careful not to sink into extraterrestrial veneration. It is your right, of course, but it is the gardens of the neighbor next door. Even if you find them beautiful, they are theirs and their societies, not yours. And there is now a need to build a fully human garden.